The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. I'd like to begin by saying that this tie that I'm wearing is partly in honor of John Aljo, uh, who unfortunately was not able to be here, and he's certainly missed by all of us. As you probably know, he is quite an authority on the mystical meaning of Harry Potter. And this tie is the tie of Glorfindel, which is a college that, or school that Harry Potter was at at Hogwarts. It also happens to be the tie of the University of Southern California, uh, which is where <laughs> I taught for some 30 years. Uh, USC has a very distinguished film school. And I might mention that a member of our community, Adi Kabigtin, recently graduated from that school, uh, cum laude, and we're certainly very proud of her. I gather there is a story about how those two ties happen to be the same, but um, that would kind of get us off track from our topic for this afternoon, Theosophy and the World Religions. But since we're talking about colleges a little bit, I might be also begin by saying that a big academic sin nowadays is what is called essentialism. Essentialism basically means seeing what is really a social construct or human institution, whatever, as having uh, some kind of intrinsic essence or nature, even apart from what the people within it give to it. I think in some ways this is just one of those academic fads that come and go, but I think it does present a caution that is important in thinking about religion, possibly even also about theosophy. Because it is too easy to assign a kind of essence or permanent meaning to a religion, like Buddhism, Christianity, whatever, or maybe even to religion itself, without taking into account the changing roles that religion can have, the changing meanings that religion or particular religions can have in different cultures in different places. Now, I'll mention later, but I might just mention it now too, H.P. Blavatsky and um, the Theosophical tradition has always emphasized that religions were, are not absolute in themselves, but were formed by a master of the wisdom for a particular time and place, a particular role in the spiritual evolution of humanity, the solar system, the universe as a whole. It's a little too easy sometimes to say that, say, Buddhism or Christianity teaches this or that. Technically, we should probably say that a preponderance of people within Buddhism or Christianity might teach this or that, but even that doesn't really say how important it is actually to them as over against other aspects of the same tradition. In fact, in the last analysis, you would have to say, I suppose, that There is really no such thing as Buddhism or Christianity or, or religion as a whole, except in the sense that each individual Buddhist, Christian, Christian or religionist or theosophist has his or her own Buddhism, Christianity, theosophy, or religion. Certainly there would be what is called a family resemblance among all of the, shall we say, Buddhists. Uh, just as within a family, you know, a newborn baby won't look exactly like anybody else in the family, but will say, well, he has his father's nose and his mother's eyes and that sort of thing. So certainly there are a lot of things that people of a tradition would have in common, but they're never going to be exactly identical. Now, the reason for starting off with this is that I think this really ties in with how I see theosophy as looking at the religious panorama of world history and of the world present and indeed future. In Isis Unveiled, H.P. Blavatsky said, uh, truth remains one, and there is not a religion, whether Christian or heathen, that is not firmly built upon the rock of ages, God and immortal spirit. Now, I think this is a sound starting point in the sense that absolutely fundamental to theosophy 
is the primacy of consciousness as a creative principle in both the cosmos and the human being. And religion must begin with an intuitive sense of this primal reality. Plato said that philosophy arises from a sense of wonder. In fact, he said that sometimes his head spins with just a sense of wonder at the marvel, at the greatness, tremendousness of things. The exalted awe that a child may feel at a gorgeous sunset or flower, or even at seeing a lowly worm. I remember how my son, when he was about two or three years old, uh, went into a kind of rapture at seeing a slug out in our backyard. Um, one of my favorite mystical writers, Thomas Traherne, a 17th century English mystic, wrote this, wrote this about how the world appeared to him as a child. The corn was oriented to mortal wheat, which never should be reaped nor ever sown. I thought it had stood from everlasting to everlasting. The dust and stones of the street were as precious as gold. The gates at first the end of the world. The green trees, when I saw them first uh, through one of the gates, transported and ravished me. Their sweetness and unusual beauty made my heart to leap and almost mad with ecstasy. They were such strange and wonderful things. The men, oh, what venerable and revered reverend creatures did the aged seem, immortal cherubims, and young men glittering and sparkling angels, and made strange seraphic pieces of life and beauty. Boys and girls tumbling in the street and playing were moving jewels. I knew not that they were ever born or should die, but all things abided eternally as they were in their proper places. Eternity was manifest in the light of the day, and something infinite behind everything appeared. In the same way, I think that we, even as adults, may feel something like this uh, if we have not, as the poet Wordsworth put it, allowed the shadows of the prison house to close round and the clouds of glory with which we entered this subluminar world to be scattered. So it is, I believe, that religion, philosophy, and theosophy begin with the expansiveness, the joy, and awe at the splendor of things, a magnificence that hints at more than can be conveyed just by the material senses or contained just in the short span between physical birth and death. The mind some early philosopher or mystic must have mused is capable of ecstasy, literally standing outside of oneself, of deep memory, and of wide imaginings, of moments of awareness that seem unbounded. Surely this is the God and immortal spirit at the heart of religion. In Isis Unveiled, if by immortal spirit we mean that dimension of human nature susceptible of being seized by rapture, and by God we mean the extrapolation of that dimension to the infinite universe itself. A thousand myths reflect the origin of primal humanity's recognition of itself as a child of the universe. We are kin to the stars and sunsets, our first ancestors believed. Whatever in us must have existed at least potentially in the universe itself from the beginnings of space and time is also uh, within us now, as the stands of Zhan in the Secret Doctrine recite, and as many myths of origin put it by, perhaps in more anthropomorphic terms, by talking about gods and goddesses as having role in creation. But what this is really saying, I believe, is that there is nothing out there that is alien to what is in us. If consciousness is within us, then in some sense it must be out there in the universe too, because uh, we came out of the universe. We didn't drop in from some other sphere. Why else would we have it within ourselves? To my mind, then, this primal awareness is the ultimate meaning of ancient wisdom, of which theosophy speaks, as it makes it the hidden heart of religion. For though clothed in the garb of many religions and philosophy and even sciences, the first wisdom is finally not a packet of doctrines or dogmas, a creed or catechism, 
so much as the ultimate questions and sublime feeling by which we humans are caught up and sometimes tormented, and out of which we formulate our faith and philosophies. Indeed, this agony and ecstasy may not be limited to humans. In our own finite understanding of the term, Jane Goodall, the great contemporary student of chimpanzee behavior, describes a party of the animals going down a valley as though intentionally to the great Concombe waterfall. There, a couple of chimps swung playfully from vines over the dazzling waters, while a younger set of the primates watched as though entranced. Jane Goodall asks, were the chimpanzees expressing feelings of awe, such as those which, in early man, surely gave rise to primitive religion, worship of the elements, worship of the mystery of water, which seems, which seems alive, always rushing on, yet never going, always the same, yet ever different. But does this common origin of philosophy and religion and the ecstasy of God and immortal spirit mean that all religions are the same? This facile assumption, often heard from well-meaning, liberal-minded people, I think needs to be examined carefully. I think there are two fallacies here at two extremes. One is that saying that all religions are exactly the same. Uh, the other saying that they are all totally different. They all have the same object, is what I'm trying to argue, the sense of God and immortal spirit, the oneness within us and within the infinite universe. But the way in which it is, as it were, refracted uh, down to different cultures and societies may well be quite different. A bit of world travel, even a visit to the fabulous range of places of worship in a city like Los Angeles or Chicago, ought to dispel the sameness idea on a superficial level. Take, for example, the central symbols of the world religions such as the figure of the Buddha, or of Krishna, of the cross, or the star and crescent, and set them against that primordial god and immortal spirit. What do they say about how they mediate that timeless reality to their own time and place? The Buddha, often though not always, portrayed seated in deep meditation on the altars of his temples, tells us that it is through inward channels that we can find our way to the joy of immortal spirit within and then, through it, to its outer counterpart in the immortal spirit called God, or the universal Buddha nature, or nirvana, of the entire universe in its inexplicable suchness. Krishna, on the other hand, playing his flute in the dance-like triple bend posture, perhaps accompanied by his beloved consort Radha, seems to stay in, say instead that the universe is like a vast game by dancing the cosmos or playing with it like a child. One advances into its heart. The cross, in contrast, represents a brutal, brutal method of execution favored by the Romans for slaves and criminals or rebels of the lowest class. This may not always seem to be the case when we see it be beautified as it often is with gold and jewels on the altars of churches, yet properly the cross ought to bring to our inner ears the groans of the tortured. It ought to have the emotional impact to us of a gallows or an electric chair placed on the altar. The cruciform symbol, of course, is also a representation of the earth in its four directions and much else esoterically. Yet, in its religious context, it is important always to recall how it tells us the way to the heart of God and immortal spirit is not only through meditation or play. There can also be the path of suffering, leading to that unimaginable reversal, joy keener than grief, of Easter. The star and crescent of Islam, like the cross in a less precise way, the Buddha, also is the historical memorial of a historical event. In this case, the Hajira, or flight of the prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina in the year 622. That is, of course, by the Christian calendar. 
It is said that his way was lit at night by the light of the moon and a single star. The symbol is also undoubtedly a reference back to the pre-Islamic religion of Arabia, which centered around worship of the stars and other astral bodies. Now, these three, at least, of the symbols that I just mentioned of Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam all come from the age of the great religious founders. And this leads us to recognize a very basic dividing line in world religions. Those that are the product of what the philosopher Carl Jaspers called the Axial Age, and those from the different preceding world of what has been called cosmic religion. The Axial Age was basically the period around the fifth century before the Common Era, the age of the Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tzu, as well as the greatest Greek philosophers and Hebrew prophets. We need to remember these were all more or less contemporary, though in many different parts of the world. It was a time when, for whatever reason, new and far-reaching questions were being asked and new discoveries were being made about human life and individual responsibility. The fresh mentality of the Axial Age was certainly a result of the invention of writing, came a little ways before, and subsequently of the discovery of history, the realization that we live in irreversible historical time, things change and they don't change back. On an annual cycle, as was often thought in cosmic uh, preliterate religion. Now, this was also a time of greater emphasis on the individual, consequent to increased complexity of society and the division of labor in the ancient empires that were flourishing more and more. In the Axial Age, the individual was made responsible in a new way for his or her moral life and fate with a new precision. The new religions emphasized in a way that the older ones did not, individual karma, or individual salvation based on individual faith choices in the different religions. No less important, the Axial Age's new historical awareness brought to religion what is called eschatology, a sense that human time, that is human history and individual human lives, leading up to a culmination, a final judgment, a new heaven and earth, or at least the commencement of a radical new cycle as in the Eastern religions where you know, the cycle from the Golden Age to the Kali Yuga and then eventually starting all over again and so forth. Along with end times came understanding that events of profound religious importance can happen in historical time, in our own time. The incarnation of gods, the proclamation of good news, the day of our salvation. All of this is encapsulated in the grandest, most archetypal Axial Age figure, the founder of a great new religion. So this was the age of the religious founders, whose long rays of light still illuminate the world today. And they have had far more importance for human history than countless kings or presidents. The Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tzu, I think for this purpose we can expand the uh, Axial Age to include Jesus and Muhammad, a uh, half millennium and a full millennium later. But this is all kind of, of a type. And of course, now the great majority of the world's population, at least nominally, is within the cultural area of one of the founder religions from this Axial Age period, not uh, from the old cosmic religion that went before. Though, of course, it is still to be found in many indigenous peoples in a religion like Shinto that I'll be talking about tomorrow. And, um, being rediscovered by some of the Wiccans and Neo-Pagans today. But so far as the Axial Age founder religions are concerned, the important thing about them is that they started in historical time at a time when, in the words of the famous Christ, uh, Christmas hymn, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight, in Bethlehem at a particular time and place in our own history. So then what characterized religion before the Axial Age? What Mersha Eliade, my old teacher, called cosmic religion, a religion not linked to a point in historical time, but to the creation itself or to the nature around us. 
especially such sacred places as uh, hallowed groves and mountains, the turn of the seasons. Festivals are festivals of seed time and harvest and of New Year's, but not as in the founder religions like Passover, Christmas, Easter, at least nominally connected to something, an event that happened in a particular date in history. Although, of course, it is true that much of cosmic religion has been carried over in these religions, and you can also see, for example, Christmas as a traditional New Year's or winter solstice festival, and Easter or Passover as a traditional spring festival. Nonetheless, this cosmic versus axial age divides world religion. A different historical setting of each reminds us it is not inaccurate to say that all the world religions, it would not be accurate to say they all teach exactly the same doctrines or inculcate the same values because they came out of a different time and place. You may only think about something like the long-standing tension in Chinese society between the Confucian exaltation of the family on the one hand and the Buddhist and Taoist also when they came in, higher evaluation of monastic celibacy. Does our son become a good Confucian father, a head of his family, or does he become a monk? Or the way in which Muslims have accused Christians of polytheism on the basis of their doctrine of the Trinity, or in which the different religions have often said very uncomplimentary things about the avatars of the other ones, uh, Christians about Muhammad and vice versa and so on, uh, which regrettably one still hears. But on a more positive note, it is worth noting that it is precisely religious differences that make the interreligious dialogue valued by so many of us important. If we only expected to hear what we already know, and to see reflected in the words and experience of another something exactly the same as our own, we would not learn very much that was new. Rather, we expand our own awareness by honestly hearing God in a mortal spirit expressed in fresh language and known through unfamiliar practices. This is not only an experience of learning, it is also, I believe, an exercise in love or compassion, the fundamental virtue of many faiths, because if love means anything at all, it seems to me it means ability to know and experience one who is different from the oneself, but to, as it were, get into his or her shoes or even his or her heart. And to respect that difference and to know that the diversity of humankind is a wonderful thing. But I believe, again, there is, some, there is a very significant sense in which we can say that all religions are the same, or more precisely that, as Theosophy says, they are all vehicles or veiled forms of the same ancient wisdom before the different races or cultures or stages of history. But that wisdom is not so much creed or complete body of doctrine as an awareness, perhaps largely beyond words like that of Jane Goodall's chimps, of God and immortal spirit. They point to higher reality, but they do not and cannot fully define it. Then with the development of human language, that awareness needed to be put into forms, making it and its source concrete enough to affect the symbols, art, culture, and ethics of a society, however imperfectly. In her book, Seven Great Religions, Annie Besant writes of each religion as, quote, coming from this one great brotherhood, as an expression by some member of, or messenger of that brotherhood of the eternal spiritual truth, an expression suited to the needs of the time at which it was made and of the dawning civilization that it was intended to mold and guide in its evolution. She adds that each religion has its own mission, that of imparting spiritual wisdom to a particular culture, and in the process, making it part of the spiritual evolution of the planet as a whole. H.P. Blavatsky's 
1888 essay, Is Theosophy a Religion?, tells us that, quote, Theosophy is not a religion, but rather Theosophy is religion itself, a religion in the true and only correct sense. It is a bond uniting men together, not a particular set of dogmas or beliefs. And not only men, she adds, but also all beings and all things in the entire universe into one grand whole. I assume that includes women, too. A further statement to this effect is worth quoting. She says, thus theosophy is not a religion, we say, but religion itself, the one bond of unity, which is so universal and all-embracing that no man has no speck from gods down and mortal down to animals. The blade of grass and the atom can be outside its light. Therefore, any organization or, or body of that name, that is, any religion, must necessarily be a universal brotherhood. She goes on to emphasize again that this religion is not a set of beliefs, but an expression of the original wisdom religion, which in our view, seem, which seems to be implicit here, is above all that sense of wonder and awe virtually before language at the marvel of the universe that can be expressed in a sense of God and immortal spirit. Now, over the centuries, the great religions have changed and developed. The great world religion like Buddhism, Christianity, or Islam, with expressions across many nations, cultures, and historical eras, can hardly be expected always to remain exactly as it was at the time of its original founder. Some of this may well be corruption, as some theosophical and other sources have liked to emphasize. All the major world religions, in fact, became the dominant force in a large society because of their, their karma or good fortune, allowed them to become early affiliated with a great empire, which made that religion a part of its polity. Buddhism with the Ashokan Empire, Christianity with the late Roman Empire under Constantine, Islam with the Caliphate, Confucianism with the Han Dynasty in China, and so forth. Needless to say, the situation enabled many ambitious clerics to attach their fortunes with those of the empire and its various corruptions. Moreover, as the religion had at least nominally to convert millions of people, mostly peasants in those days, mostly illiterate, it found ways to accommodate itself to the prevailing cosmic folk religion, so that holy wells, sacred groves, festivals, and so forth of the old cosmic religion became, as we have seen in the case of Christianity with various saints and, of course, even with festivals like Christmas and Easter, adaptations uh, to the new axial age faith. The holy wells became sacred to saints or bodhisattvas and so forth. A book, a book which was mentioned this morning by Cheryl Gilchrist, forthcoming in the Quest edition, The Soul of Russia, offers a truly beautiful and heart-warm-hearted heart heart warm view of how in H.P. Blavatsky's homeland, a continuing folk religion of spirits of house, bath, and wood, together with innumerable magical beliefs, have coexisted with Russian Orthodoxy and even with communism. So also say voodoo and Roman Catholicism in Haiti. Now, I don't think we should be too hard on religions for expanding their coverage, so to speak, through these new old forms which embrace the outlook of cosmic religion under the aegis of the new. Forms that were so congenial to many ordinary people past and present or that we should fall into the extreme Protestant notion that only the earliest scriptural form of religion is at all authentic. Something I think can also be said for John Henry Newman's concept of the development of doctrine, broadening it to include all faiths and not just his own Roman Catholicism, the idea that some ideas or practices may be only implicit in a religion at the beginning, but can emerge as explicit at the right time, in the right cultural context. So it is today, for example, that one can find a very wide gamut of forms in Buddhism, from Tibetan yoga and esoteric mudras and mantras, to the simple faith of Pure Land in East Asia, faith 
in the vow of Amida Buddha to bring all who call upon his name into the Western paradise, or the quiet Zen meditation or Vipassana analysis of consciousness, even though many of these would probably have seemed very strange to the Buddha himself. But nonetheless, this is not all corruption, but rather means by which Buddhism has been able to operate in many cultures and with many kinds of personalities beyond those of ancient India 25 centuries ago. Of course, devout Mahayana Buddhists will say that the Buddha himself gave out many of these as secret teachings and practices, requesting that they be hidden until the world was ready for them. Finally, I would like to bring our attention to the situation of the world religions today and in the future. Lately, we have been reading polls indicating a decline in religious identification and attendance, even here in the United States, although ours as a nation often considered elsewhere to be the most religious of the world's major countries. Perhaps this decline is a backlash against the late 20th century rise of evangelicalism, especially its association with conservative politics. That in turn is perhaps a backlash against the spirit of the 1960s and so forth when could go back and back. But whether this decline will only produce another pro-religion backlash down the line or whether it is the first stage of European style secularization where only 5 or 10% of the population are very religious in the American sense of the word and which seems to be more or less permanent remains to be seen. Europe and America, despite much common history, are probably more profoundly different in religion than in any other way. To begin with, most of the European countries have traditionally had a state church, which was strongly identified with both the government and the culture, as well as the history. Whereas America is perhaps the only major country in the world in which a majority of the population descend from religious dissenters who perhaps came here in order to escape persecution from those same kind of state churches or governments back in the old country or something comparable. This obviously produces an extremely different mentality about religion. In Europe, where the church is likely to be uh, the oldest and most prominent edifice in town and to carry the invisible marks of centuries of religious war, privilege, and persecution, it may be a proud historical monument, but for newer generations, it bears just too much history and wearisome manners and morals, real life for them is elsewhere. And one can perceive something of the same attitude toward the great temples of Asia. In Japan, at least, one can see endless parties of tourists and school children passing through temples, but few worshipers. Maybe we are slowly moving in that way too, but again, we need to realize how different religion is in our nation of immigrants and of the separation of church and state. They I said, it's the only country with a majority of religionists not associated with a uh, privileged religion in their homelands, a few of us, born Episcopalians like myself and some Lutherans and Presbyterians may be, but the vast majority of Americans from those of Puritan background to Quakers, Methodists, Baptists, to Jews or Irish or Polish Catholics or members of African American churches are of a faith that was dissident rather than established back home. Furthermore, the, in the American separationist environment, religion is free enterprise and pluralistic the responsibility of its adherents and not of the tax collectors. As a consequence, religion traditionally has been seen in a positive light, as something we did for ourselves, building a church just as nice as the one on the next corner. And for the vast millions of immigrants, as well as ex-slave Africans, the church or synagogue has not been an oppressive feudal institution, as it might have seemed in Europe, but a place for community with one's ethnic group, perhaps the one real friend and support one had in a confusing land of exploitative bosses and strange language. All this needs to be understood, even though times may be changing, as, some, as the newer immigrant generations recede more and more into the past, scientific education, new technologies, new kinds of prosperity 
create a different world. And no doubt, times are changing in the world as a whole. In China, though temples and churches remain, by some accounts, are growing. The situation is certainly far more secular than it was before the Communist Re Revolution. In Japan, there is what is now called the post-Ohm effect, uh, triggered by the Ohm Shinrikyo group and its sarin gas attack in the Tokyo subway in 1995. This triggered what was probably already latent, a certain reaction, apparent in public religion polls, uh, public opinion polls, rather, against religion, especially against Buddhism and the so-called new religions. It's interesting that since then, there uh, seems to have been a somewhat more positive presentation of Shinto in Japanese literature, but a kind of reaction against Buddhism, which is, even after a thousand years, is still seen by many Japanese as a foreign import. I know less about the situation in India, but I would find it hard to believe that a new generation of Bangalore high-tech adepts are likely to be as piously Hindu as their grandparents. Only when religion is strongly uh, identified with nationalism and popular protest does it maintain powerful support, as in some Muslim countries or places like Ireland and Bosnia, where tragic conflicts have erupted along religious lines. Even there, as I gather is now the case with many young people in Iran and in Ireland, there is covert backlash in favor of a more, we say, normal cosmopolitan way of life, less identified with a strong religious nationalism. But all of this is also to be expected theosophically. I have previously suggested in, talk, in a talk in this place, although from the other end of the room, and in articles published in the Quest, that perhaps we could view the third root race, the Lemurian, as Paleolithic society, the fourth, or Atlantean, as Neolithic, that is human culture after the discovery of agriculture, and the fifth root race, in which we now find ourselves, as essentially inaugurated by the Axial Age, the age of the great religious founders, as I suggested earlier. Now, I would further suggest we may be reaching the end of that era, the Axial Age, or fifth root race era and are preparing for a really new spiritual configuration of the sixth root race. In the fifth root race, humanity was especially expected to explore and experience the meaning of the material plane. For the most part, we have done that well enough. Our science and technology has brought us incomparable knowledge of the laws of nature, of the atom and the galaxy, and of the application of those laws in the making of tools from the bronze knife to the computer. Downsides, of course, there have, begin, begun, there have been, beginning with the terrible misuse of technology for human exploitation and war, owing to the dismal fact that our moral evolution has hardly kept pace with our scientific progress. An equally serious consequence of this fifth root race way of thinking is that our very success in rational scientific work has suggested the same as a model for philosophizing in other spheres where it is less appropriate, and indeed I would say sometimes disastrous, such as the religious. A master in the Mahatma letter speaks of our civilization as one which rests so exclusively upon intellect. I might amend that even to say intellect understood as rational ways of thinking in the narrow sense of the word. Insofar as this applies to religion, I think it explains why religion has been so much seen as a matter of dogma, like scientific axioms or laws, which entail other doctrines with mathematical logic and which need to be imposed with no less harsh rigor. If scientific ways of thinking in terms of reason and laws of nature, induction and deduction and so on, have worked so well in one sphere, why not do the same with religion? And so you develop your logical summas and catechisms and so on. But this is a very fifth root race way of looking at religion, 
but hardly compatible with seeing it as a fluid consequence of the primordial wordless sense of awe at God and immortal spirit expressed in the brotherhood of humanity. Religion itself points in another direction when it makes conscience and above all love, as did even Thomas Aquinas, as a final court of appeal of the mind and soul. For if conscience means anything, it means that the inner integrity of the individual is more important than any mental construct. If love means anything, it means accepting others in their differences from oneself as well as in their similarities. Increasingly in our world, we are coming to see such an interactive, loving kind of understanding as the way in which the world ought to be across religion, caste, races, races, nationalities, gender orientation, personal differences. All areas in which the fifth root race laid down many rigid rules as a shadow side of its scientific or pseudoscientific thinking. In the sixth root race just over the horizon, I believe our calling will be to expand our capacity for love by embracing persons of all kinds and to explore their inwardness with sensitivity and appreciation. Along with this will come an appropriate recovery of psychic and mystical capacities, the necessary tools for a profound understanding of ourselves and of that which is beyond ourselves. This is how I see the coming sixth root race, a people of pluralism, individuality, new ways of imagining God and immortal spirit. And I see this already beginning to appear amongst us. I think the present crises in fifth root race style religion and morals, so disturbing to some people, is really a sign of incipient transition to a new kind of world, to be welcomed and gently guided in the right directions. This can certainly be a function of the theosophical society with, with its ideal of the universal brotherhood of humanity. Now, of course, it is also a dangerous moment, as are all times of transition. There is no guarantee that humanity will always make the right choices, or even that it will survive at all. For a moment of transition is no less a time of free will. We are told in theosophical lore that the transitions from the third and fourth root races to what came next involved great catastrophes, the destruction of Lemuria by underground fire, of Atlantis by flood. Perhaps our next transition will be in the context of nuclear or ecological disaster, but the important thing to realize is that it need not be. We are free. We humans could all change peacefully to the sixth root race way of being tomorrow, if we so decided. Evolution has prepared us to make that choice, but how or whether we make it is up to us. It may be that some of us will not be able to change until the fifth root race world has been so devastated by war or climate holocausts that not much of it is left anyway, and we must move on willy-nilly. But I hope not. Again, it is up to us. And it really starts within us. I'd like to end with a passage from Carl Jung, in which he wrote on a, a history in a way that I have long found impressive, even haunting. It reminds us that change really begins in the consciousness of the individual, that what happens out there in the outer world of events is really no more than a reflection of what happens, what change occurs within each of us. Here is what Jung said. When we look at human history, we see only what happens on the surface, and even this is distorted in the faded mirror of tradition. But what has really been happening eludes the inquiring eye of the historian, for the true historical event lies deeply buried, experienced by all and observed by none. It is the most private and subjective of psychic experiences. Wars, dynasties, social upheavals, conquests, and religions are but the superficial symptoms of a secret psychic attitude unknown even to the individual himself 
and transmitted by no historian, perhaps the founders of the great religions give us the most information in this regard. The great events of world history are at bottom profoundly unimportant. In the last analysis, the essential thing is the life of the individual. This alone makes history. Here alone do the great transformations first take place, and the whole future, the whole history of the world, ultimately springs as a gigantic summation from these hidden sources in individuals. In our most private and most subjective lives, we are not only the passive witnesses of our age and, and its sufferers, but also its makers. We make our own epoch. It is up to us, then, whether we want to make the world of the sixth root race with its more pluralistic, tolerant, mystical way of life, or whether we wish to cling to the old, the fifth root race, which brought so many marvels, but whose time is nearly past until we are pushed by disaster into the new. In the process, we can bring with us the treasures of the great world religions, but hold on to them in a new way, in freedom and joy, rather than chauvinism and compulsion, with a view to the ongoing, ever-changing drama of God and the mortal spirit. Thank you. Uh, your discussion uh, turned about uh, on such questions as our consciousness and what is within us and how we will mm -hmm. change our religion and so on. I wonder if you could uh, become a, a bit more foundational and tell us why, in the beginning, there is a need for religion. Can't we somehow formulate a philosophy for a good life hmm. without the need for gods and religion? Where, where did the need for this come from? Well, I don't know if you can, should call it a need. You know, some people just seem to like it. Whether it's a, <laughs> uh, whether they, you know, people always accuse other people of being religious only because they're afraid of going to hell or something like that. But I've never known anybody who really said that firsthand about themselves. You know, they always talk about the joy that their religion gives them or the sense of meaning and purpose that it gives them. And um, that, so that's one thing I would say. A second thing I would say is, as I did at the beginning, that we need to think of words like religion or the specific religions in these, if I use the jargon, non-essentialist kind of ways. I mean, religion isn't just something out there that has its absolute own nature. It is something that means something different to every person who is religious, as just as God and the immortal spirit probably do. Um, I recall their conference yesterday with that wonderful discussion we had with the, with the young people uh, from the interfaith um, core, whatever they call it. And uh, somebody asked, um, what would each of your religions say about the afterlife? And I kind of knew what the Christian and the Muslim would say about it. I cringed a little bit about putting that question to the Jewish representative because you know, the afterlife is just not as important in Judaism or as well defined in Judaism as, as it is in these, in these other religions. Uh, some Kabbalistic Jews believe in reincarnation. Uh, some don't. Um, some believe in a kind of heaven or a, sh a shadowy kind of Sheol, as you get from the ancient scriptures, or even in. Um, but many don't have any particular belief or care about the afterlife at all. I, there are. I've even talked personally to quite conservative rabbis, so far as uh, the religious practice is concerned who say they're quite agnostic on things like that. You know, it's just not what religion really means to them. To, in Judaism, and I would say this is true of Shinto, and perhaps some others also, far more important are the practices, the way you keep the Sabbath, and what that means to the home and family, uh, the, the festivals, of course, and the, and the Jewish community, and all of its uh, passion and struggles and suffering and everything. Um, so I think we don't want to have an essentialist idea that religion always has to have do something with the afterlife or with God or anything else. I mean, it can have many different uh, contours in, in this respect. And 
So, well, I guess that's okay. what I would say there. You know, if you say, why do we have to religion, have religion, I suppose, uh, you know, I would ask, first of all, why not have religion? And secondly, I would ask, what do you mean by religion anyway? Uh, if I could add just one more thing on that, I'm, because this is important to me. Uh, there is a historian of religion, Canadian, named Cantwell Smith, who wrote a book called The Meaning and End of Religion. And... Um, but his argument was that the whole idea of a religion is a modern construct anyway, uh, that we don't even want to essentialize it so much as to say that it's an ancient tradition, because um, there is really no traditional word in most traditional languages that mean what religion means to us today. Buddhists or rather, might talk about the Dharma. Hindus would talk about the Dharma in a different sense of the word, but that covers all sorts of things. I mean, it covers not only how you offer sacrifices, but it, Dharma covers, uh, you know, the caste system, uh, how you organize family life, and uh, so forth and so on. In medieval Europe, uh, there is no word for religion in our sense. Uh, if you called somebody a religious, that meant they were a monk or a priest. And they might talk about Christendom, but that's just the, their own worldview in a then more or less Christian society. So, you know, it just means whatever it means to the, in the individual context. Now we think of a religion in kind of the sense that you and I mean by it, that is a system of some sort of belief, which is, as it were, detachable from the rest of society. So that um, you could be, say, religious uh, in our society as a Christian or Jew or humanist or something, but you could also not be religious and still be a citizen and do everything else the same way. You could be like you, philosophical about it instead of religious. But in traditional India, that just wouldn't make much sense. I mean, there wasn't any such thing as religion. There was only Dharma. Everybody had to follow Dharma some way or another in terms of their family life and caste life and so on. But if you ask them what their religion was, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. And that's even more true in a lot of uh, primal societies. You know, you go to a tribesman and say, uh, what is your religion, well, they'd say, you're, what are you talking about? You're crazy. But you say, well, you do these dances before you go out for a hunt. He said, well, that's just, that's just what we do, you know. It's just our way of life. Why not? <laughs> but, it, it's but, so true yeah. that that, that mm -hmm. is a cultural yeah. definition. I noticed yes. each one of the young people said that it was a cultural yes, definition. Yes, that's right. Very true. One more question. Okay. Robert, I'd yeah. like for you to um, tag on to what you have just said. Um, it seems to me that a lot of what we are now um, categorizing mm -hmm. as religion uh, has a sacerdotal aspect mm -hmm. to it. And uh, I, th I think uh, you know, some of the things where Ted comes from, um, he, of course, is extricating himself from any sacerdotal mm -hmm. uh, perception, but it seems to me that that personal side of religion that you have yeah. espoused, that that does have a lot of, uh, well, it comes out of a sacerdotal, certainly within the Christian tradition. Well, it comes out of a tradition of institutional religion, whereas it means the role of religious professionals, by which I suppose you mean priests when you use the word sacerdotal, you know, it might be ministers or somebody else in, in other traditions. But it does, it certainly does come out of a, institutional structure. And um, that's another difficult topic. I mean, everybody has problems with religious institutions, I think, somewhere along the line. I certainly have. Yet on the other hand, you know, if you didn't have them, uh, these traditions would simply have died out at all if it wasn't for the Christian church and any knowledge even of ancient Christianity or the, you could say the same about Buddhism and so on. You know, institutions have to be vehicles for trans transition, transmission from one generation to another. But um, uh, maybe you can be religious in a way that is somewhat independent of the of institutions in the specific sense that you're talking about. And this is in a way often true, I think, in East Asia, where most people are affiliated. Well, I could talk about Japan, you know, most of them have a traditional affiliation with both Shinto and Buddhism. 
which are much more closely merged in the Middle Ages. But that's another story. And um, uh, you know, they, often they're married in Shinto shrines because those are places associated with the happy, this worldly affairs of life. But funerals are out of Buddhist temples because Buddhism is more associated in the Japanese mind with the great mysteries of life and death and what happens after you die and stuff like that. But on the other hand, most Japanese will say they're not religious anyway. You know, I uh, had an interesting situation. If I mean, tell another story. When uh, I was still a graduate student, was studying for a year in Japan, uh, writing a dissertation on Shinto, and um, we were renting a house from a Japanese professor who was spending that year teaching at a state college in Mississippi, of all places. <laughs> and, was, uh, uh, and so we had this house available for that year. And we got to corresponding first about maintaining the house. And then uh, he asked me what I was doing. And I said I was studying Japanese religion. He said, well, that's a funny thing to do, because the Japanese don't have any religion. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, what about all of these shrines and temples that I see, and these festivals, and matsuri, and uh, funerals and Buddhist memorial service and Buddhist temple. And he said, well, that's not religion. That's just sort of folk custom, you know. But on the other hand, people here in Mississippi, they're real, really religious, you know. They, <laughs> they go to the Baptist church all the time, and even the state legislature debates about whether things are in accordance with the Bible. This was in 1966, so you can imagine what those issues might have been. And uh, uh, finally, I realized the problem was uh, again, it's a matter of language. You know, the Japanese word shukyo is usually used to translate religion in modern Japanese. But it doesn't really mean religion in the broader sense of the word. It traditionally means the, the teaching of a sect or Buddhist denomination. And so his idea, that of many Japanese, is that if you don't follow one particular religion, like Baptists say, or Pure Land Buddhism or something, well, then you're not really religious. You know? You're just plugging into a lot of popular customs and so on, whether you call them religious or not, probably don't. So anyway, that's just an example of how these words can mean very different things in different contexts. <laughs>